The World and Man, part one of a five-part series. As human population grows, men are making an ever-increasing impact on their environment, colonizing its land, consuming its resources, releasing huge quantities of waste into its seas and atmosphere. The process grows relentlessly, despite the fact that its effects are not well understood. On this cassette, three speakers give an assessment of what in fact we are doing to our world. They are Dr. Alexander King, Director General for Scientific Affairs with OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Dr. Aurelio Pecci, Vice Chairman of the Olivetti Organization, Idris Shah, writer and Middle Eastern authority with interests in cultural and scientific circles. All three speakers are members of the Club of Rome, of which Dr. King and Dr. Pecci were in fact the founders. They talk to Robert O. Miller, an American news correspondent now working in Rome. Dr. King, in beginning this conversation, or this informal discussion, might I ask you to give a background to this subject, a general introduction to our discussion, underlining the salient points so as to put things in proper perspective and to place the subject in its proper context. Well, let's look at it like this. There are many problems appearing in the world which are, are worrying people. Naturally, after the war, we had the Damocles sword of the atomic bomb, and many people are still worried. And then, from that, other war problems, such as Vietnam, raising the general moral responsibility, and disturbing the youth particularly. But, in addition, there are a whole variety of problems arising, which we can, evidence of which we can see every day. The simplest is that of the environment. Everyone is worried about the deterioration of the environment. I, it has become so popular, in fact, I call it the environmental bandwagon. And I secretly feel that some governments are rather pleased to have this. Because here is an enemy which everyone can fight and which won't fight back. And it can divert attention from looking at problems of race and poverty and all sorts of other things. But it is a real problem. We must look at the future of the Earth and whether we are not destroying it for other generations. It's not merely the question of bad air and bad water, but are we gradually accumulating in the ocean all sorts of chemicals and things which will upset the balance of nature and in fact make many of our present approaches and ways of living impossible? This no doubt will come in your cassette on the, on the oceans. The other clearest, biggest problem is that of population again, on which you will have a special approach. But when one thinks that uh, the population of the world, uh, which was uh, doubling every 200 years, some centuries ago, is now doubling at a rate about once every 28 to 30 years, one realizes that we could reach a state, a state or a stage of standing room only, and that things will go bad long before then. Furthermore, it's not merely a matter of population increasing only, but as the population increases, agriculture has to improve. And in, in improving agriculture, we need bigger farms, mechanization, use of fertilizers, and therefore people flow away from the land. So that the advantages of a better agriculture merely add to the difficulties in the cities. It is suggested that, for example, the, the population of Mexico City may grow to be as big as 50 million by the end of this century. It's, of course, intolerable, and no doubt won't happen. Facts will emerge which will make it change. So that the total number of people present is one of the big changes which leads to problems. It's a matter of scale. It causes problems to governments which they're not capable of attacking at the moment. And furthermore, it means that people are flowing into places like Calcutta and Dar es Salaam. And instead of a, an underemployed rural population in many parts of the world, we, have now we are now accumulating semi-literate, unemployed urban populations, which are more dangerous, more frustrated, 
more, uh, more disease addicted, and so on. And beyond that again, there is what people are beginning to call the lemming effect, the crowding effect. Biologists have now come to the conclusion that the famous rats of Norway, the lemmings, who are supposed to run into the sea and swim to Atlantis once every seven years or so, do not do so because the food dries up. They begin this urge to get away through overcrowding long before the food supplies are exhausted. And in some countries, I would say Japan, to some extent in the Netherlands, to say nothing of some East, Euro East Asiatic countries, this effect in fr leading to frustration, uh, antisocial practices and so on is becoming very, very obvious. So that we have here also this gradual alienation of individuals from society. And this again is uh, aggravated or is exaggerated by the fact that in a small part of the world, but, the, but the, the highly developed part of the world in which we live, Europe, North America, and so on, that levels of affluence are such that a large proportion of the population feel that they needn't work. The state will look after them. So that alienation and parasitism on the state and an increasing feeling among people, young and, and old, that they have no place, no part in the decision making on things that are going to affect their own lives. This is, is giving rise to this mounting difficulties which also generate crime, drug addiction, delinquency, all kinds of unpleasant things and in a sense all these matters together with the difficulties of education where students feel that life in, in which the life they will lead when they become responsible young adults is quite will be quite different from that of the present and that they're being prepared for a, a world that is vanishing instead of a new world in which they'll find themselves these frustrations are all leading up to what we call uh, the problematique. Dr. King, there are two points I'd like to mention. One is to go back to this idea of bandwagon, and as you say, it has become rather fashionable, and with it, so to speak, to get on the bandwagon of ecology and conservation and preservation in general. Now, we've been hearing about the total destruction or the overpopulation of the world or the eventual lack of food in this world for a very long time now. Is this accelerating, or is it merely that it is a question, in a way, of crying wolf? Do you think that this whole topic is going to wear itself out? No. Uh, let's look at it in two ways. Firstly, with regard to the, shall we say, physical aspects of pollution, dirty air and water and uh, destroying the environment through industry and technology, that is a very real problem, which with greater density of industrialization could become insufferable. And in countries like Japan, it's already very bad. In a recent meeting of ministers, uh, the Japanese made very clear that they needed still more economic growth for national purposes, especially to provide the resources for uh, social development. But the, the technology on which further growth would be built, must be socially acceptable. People are rejecting the present. However, uh, these physical pollutions and destruction of the environment can be cured by technological, scientific means, by knowing better what causes them, by taking steps to prevent them. It'll cost money, but it'll probably cost, for example, a good deal less than the total number of road deaths a year cost. And we take that without much of a quiver. On the other hand, the broader social problems of the environment are very much more difficult to tackle, and very little is being done about them. So my personal fear in, in all this, what I call the environmental bandwagon, is not that it's a bad thing or unnecessary, but that it has gone a little too far in the easy parts of this problem and that the pendulum will swing, and that too little attention will, will be given to it a few years later. Is there something with which governments, rather than departments of environment, can help? Oh, yes. 
Uh, governments certainly can. Departments of environment are very important and uh, in some cases doing very well. <clears throat> but governments are facing great difficulties in tackling these problems. I think it's worthwhile going into this for a minute or two. Uh, there is, first of all, the situation that government structures in practically all countries are what one might call vertical. There are ministries for vertical sectors like health or fuel and power or transportation or agriculture or industry. Fine. But the more we look at things, the more we realize that the problems which we've been talking about are horizontal in their nature. They cover all kinds of things. And in the average country, for example, uh, urban problems are spread over some 8 to 14 agencies of the government, fractionally. And no one looks at the totality. The question of acquisition of land, of city planning, of the alternative uses and demands for land between uh, industry, amenities, housing, building of roads and railways, and all the rest of it. And then there's the question of the pollution in cities, and the question of urban transportation versus the motor car. All these are divided everywhere between departments, and no one has a total look. And governments, unlike industry or even the military, have not really developed the staff function to look at the totality in a planning sense other than sheer economic planning. So that's one of the big difficulties, and all governments at the moment are wondering what to do about it. And secondly, governments are inherently, through their bureaucracies, uh, very resistant to change. And the bureaucracies, the civil services, most of which in the advanced countries are intelligent and impartial, are nevertheless chosen to provide continuity and stability. And hence, by training, by conditioning, they're against change and find it very difficult to face up to these problems. But thirdly, and probably more so, there is this problem of the short versus the long term. Uh, with the four or five years parliamentary cycle we have in our so-called democracies, both governments and opposition parties are inevitably terribly sensitive to the immediate issues because the votes which they require will come as a result of how they attack the problems which are uppermost in the public mind for the moment. Now this, just as with all of us, means that governments are looking at the short rather than the long term. And probably until 10, 15 years ago, this didn't matter because the long term was 20 years ahead. It, the problems came over the horizon. They were tackled as they approached. But now with rapid rates of change, politically, socially, economically, technologically, the long term is more and more becoming a period of five to seven years, i.e. in the vulnerable period of the next administration. And this lack of facing up to these problems means that in the world as a whole, we're staggering through a kind of crisis management from one crisis to another, from monetary problems to balance of payments, unemployment, social problems, and then comes another eruption of monetary crisis, and then student and university problems, and the cycle starts again. We do nothing about finding out what's really wrong. Would you say, Dr. King, that perhaps technology, because of its ability to produce the quantities of goods that it does produce, has placed an accent, or has caused to be placed an accent, on the material quality of life, as opposed to the non-material aspects of living? It certainly has, but I think one can look at that again the other way around. It has responded to man's basic material demands and material selfishness. I think if one looks, for, looks back over the last 2,000 years, it's very difficult to say that there have been many accretions of human wisdom. We've increased our power, our, uh, our capacity for, for material work, our material satisfactions, but this has not been accompanied by a corresponding growth in wisdom. Well, can you reconcile this? I, I reconcile this, and this brings me back to uh, where I, I ended off my general statement. And it, it seems to me that the, the basic crisis of mankind is, in fact, biological. 
The problems I've mentioned coincide with the time also and are partly caused uh, due to the same, uh, this is partly due to the same cause, where uh, faith in conventional religion has more or less evaporated. Faith in political processes and the traditional way is becoming very much less sure. A man, a man with his degree of affluence of today is no longer kept happy with bread and circuses or kept in a straight and narrow way by fear of hellfire. Now, until recently, we've assumed, at least for the last hundred years, that through the Darwinian evolutionary processes of the survival of the fittest, that man is going to evolve, and it has evolved, as he, uh, from the animals. Now, the, the problem that faces us now is that we are no longer within the forces of organic evolution. Its processes are too slow and our own autonomous actions will destroy us, either by war or by uh, stu social stupidity, long before nature, through the process of evolution, can do anything about us. And the basic problem behind all this is that the forces within man which caused him to rise to be the greatest of the animals, including fear, vanity, a sense of power, material acquisition, etc., are all the forces today which are making for materialism and which are against man's further development as a spiritual individual. This, I think, is the basis of the human crisis. This being the case, Dr. King, how would you propose that we resolve this crisis? Now, this, of course, is a question which is impossible to answer because it, it's like asking one to solve the riddle of the universe. But uh, firstly, I think the important thing is to understand the nature of the crisis in some detail. And I'd like to say a word or two about that. The problems we've talked about are caused partly by the level of affluence that we've reached. We no longer feel the sword of hunger above our heads. We no longer have to work uh, day in, day out. We have leisure, etc. We've time to think, and most of us haven't much to think about. So that affluence, together with technology, and the increase of population, and the concentration of that population in cities, uh, has raised the, uh, many of these difficulties. But the difficulties themselves are of a nature somewhat different from those of the past, partly because of scale. They appear in all parts of the world in communist countries as well as capitalist countries. They appear to be extremely complex and they interact fiercely with one another. Now in the Club of Rome, we call this mass of problems, this cluster of problems, the problematic. And I think the first thing to do is to understand about the problematic. You see, we're at a situation at the moment where because all these problems are so interacting, but to tackle individual symptoms, individual problems as they appear, <clears throat> may in fact merely be trying to remove a symptom of a disease which isn't yet diagnosed, and to create by interactions within the total system new problems in trying to alleviate the first, because we don't understand the way in which all these things are connected the one with the other. It's for this reason and to understand something about the problematic with a view to eventually to providing some kind of guidelines toward solution that the Club of Rome was formed. As an independent group, without a bureaucracy, utterly flexible, with no vested interest, which could begin to diagnose some of these problems and their connections between them in a more objective way and more dispassionately than could be done through the normal government machineries, which are largely impotent. In that case, let's look at some examples of the sort of thing that is happening now, and may happen even more so if there isn't any form of wise guidance. Yes, I, th I think this is best illustrated by cases. The first one I take up, perhaps, is DDT. I was personally associated with the introduction of DDT during the war, and we knew at the time it had certain dangers. But if you look at the case of DDT impartially, so far it appears that it has had been of enormous benefit to mankind. 
Uh, during the war, it certainly saved hundreds of thousands of casualties, because in every war, until the Second World War, uh, insect-borne diseases have caused more deaths than the human enemy, the rat, the lice, lice, through malaria and typhus. And uh, therefore, DDT in the war made not, not only uh, prevented casualties, but it prevented an enormous amount of discomfort and misery among the soldiers. But after the war also, through eradication of malaria, DDT made life tolerable in many parts of the world where people suffering from endemic disease had been living or partly living uh, in more or less misery for generations and centuries. And this was suddenly lifted. They had energy, they could do different things. Among other things, of course, they had more children. But uh, this meant, in fact, that DDT has saved the lives of, uh, probably made possible for several million people to be alive today who would otherwise have died, and has made life possible and reasonable, comfortable, for millions of others. Yet, it's now regarded as an unmitigated evil, because it may cause very big uh, disturbance of the oceans and of the ocean organisms, and upset the whole ecology of the world. We don't know, but we suspect it may, and we should be cautious. But here is a case, you see, where wisdom is required and very difficult to achieve. DDT has caused, as I say, an enormous balance of good. As far as I know, there's only one case of someone having died from it, and this was someone I told who committed suicide by drinking a solution of DDT in paraffin oil. Whether the paraffin itself would have killed him or not is another matter. But this balance, you see, is hopelessly on the side of the positive side for DDT. Yet, in many countries, through public pressures and hysteria, legislation is prohibiting it. On the other hand, countries like some of the, uh, the African countries fighting malaria and the tsetse fly depend on this for their further economic development. And then more deeply than this, is it a good thing for the world that all these extra people are alive today thanks to DDT or not? The problems are ethical and moral as well as practical. Uh, one would also question even the Green Revolution, which is obviously, as an immediate uh, palliative in providing more food, of great benefit to mankind. But this will accelerate the process I've already mentioned of improving agriculture, of necessitating free crop uh, approach, which can't be done by peasant agriculture. Ag uh, mechanization, intensive use of fertilizers, uh, pollution of ground waters, flowing of people into the cities. But this, this is, is also illustrates the government problem, because ministers of agriculture have to pro provide more food. But the measures they take through such things as the Green Revolution to provide more food may have bad social effects which go against the tasks of other ministers who are trying to prevent big flows into the city, who are trying to attack poverty in different ways. The balance is very difficult to achieve. Dr. King, you make the brain real, and in a way, you leave the lay person in a rather worse position than he was before he heard about the bandwagon. Because if you say what is to be done in all these problems, what is the lay person to think about? Exactly. We're all humans in the same boat, unfortunately. Unfortunately, I mean that there aren't alternative boats, but obviously the first thing is to learn what the situation is. Well, thank you, Dr. King.
The situation is, of course, viable. Yet there are certain basic and fundamental factors that give it the aspect of being fixed and established, of moving toward a predictable climax. These key elements were the basis of the study commissioned by the Club of Rome. One of the founders of this Club of Rome, and one of the motivating figures in the club, is Italian industrialist Dr. Aurelio Pecce. Dr. Pecce, will you tell us about the activity of the Club of Rome in relation to its recent study, including some of the details that led up to that study? We visited many countries, scientific communities, the political class, uh, universities, uh, industrial groups, uh, Japan in Canada and United States, all over Europe, uh, in the Soviet Union, in developing countries, chiefly in Latin America, in order to say to highly qualified people that we thought that the time had come to review and assess the total situation of the world before it be too late. We were received with great curiosity and also sympathy, but we had no result at all, notwithstanding that what we were saying was the sum up of concepts put forward by spiritual leaders, by scientific groups, by the students themselves in their protests, by thinkers, philosophers, various churches, we had the same effect that they had so far, that is practically nothing. We were expecting more or less uh, this thing, so we decided to, to try if we could have a better tool of uh, communication and conviction to use, and not only to the limited audiences uh, to which we addressed initially, but uh, with respect to public opinion, world public opinion, and we were uh, somewhat fortunate in choosing a way of representing the dynamics and possible outcomes of the present situation as is provided by studies made at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, through the studies of Professor Jay Forrester. By means of simulation models, there is a possibility using computers and, and, and the most advanced techniques now uh, known to see how the projections of uh, present trends, say population, growth of affluence, uh, use of natural resources, uh, increase of pol pollution, so on, uh, how these trends uh, develop, may develop in the future and how they cross-influence one uh, another that is, which are the cross-impacts of uh, this diverse phenomena. Through an effort uh, which uh, required nearly two years by a group of nearly 20 young scientists at the MIT, a model was prepared to study five critical phenomena which now influence world situation, uh, population growth, industrialization, increasing need for food, pollution, and depletion of natural resources. These are the five variables considered and their interactions. And through this model to, to present a, a, an array of possible outcomes, uh, different scenarios of, of the future, considering the, the, the present trends. And I would assume that the result of this computer model and this study was what is now considered to be the controversial report, limits of growth, which the MIT group, under the uh, direction of uh, Professor Meadows, issued recently. We have to consider, and I hope chiefly that uh, young people will consider this as a prototype. It is the first attempt ever made uh, to have a universal vision of mankind and uh, uh, its world in a package which gives the outline of things to come without going into the detail. What were some of those things to come that this report, that this book talks about? Fundamentally, fundamentally this book is a, a comparison of dimensions. The dimension of mankind, the number of people which is growing uh, rapidly, the population explosion, as it is sometimes called this phenomenon, 
and the demands of this population, which are always increasing, and that the two are compounding each other, and all this in a limited system, uh, our planet, at certain dimensions, you can measure the natural resources, uh, stocks that are available or reachable uh, by man, and you can even uh, measure, which is uh, the dimension of the biomass, how much life there is in this planet, that there is only that and not more. Generally, in the discussions that this book has arisen, the criticism which has been leveled at, at the book concerns the physical natural resources, uh, iron deposits, oil, chromium, uh, and so on. And uh, very few people have dedicated the, the, their attention uh, to the other and much more important life support in base. Uh, this planet must uh, offer to, to mankind, and it is quantity of life uh, and the uh, nature of life uh, which uh, mankind uh, needs uh, in the future. And uh, there, probably, are the, the greatest uh, dangers. That is, uh, the danger that uh, this increasing mankind has and will have at its disposal a much uh, smaller uh, quantity of animal and plant life uh, for its needs. Uh, therefore, the more it uh, grows, uh, the lesser is the quantity of the life support in basis it has at its disposal. Thank you, Dr. Pache. To this point, our discussion has centered on the activities and the situation in the West. But there is, as well, concern and action in relation to these problems in the East. To learn what is happening in that part of the world, we turn to the distinguished writer and a leading authority on the Middle East, Idris Shah. Yes, I do think that is rather important because if we look at this material in the absence of information, that is, looking at it mostly from the Western point of view, uh, we fail to observe the large amount of work and interest which has been done and is being taken in this uh, material and this problem in the East. Dr. King, as you notice, has uh, spoken about the very important work which is being done by six or seven experts in the Argentine, in South America, an underdeveloped country. Now, we can see the affinities here with the East. The Argentine, of course, being underdeveloped, is in a very good situation to analyze its own problems through the linguistic and other bonds which it has with developed countries. So Argentine workers can find out very easily from European and other sources what the problems are and how they can be tackled. The Argentines could provide what you might call an exemplar or paradigm, a pattern for us, so that we in the other underdeveloped countries, the developing countries, could see how they have made use of Western information and projected it onto their own problems. Similarly, we have in the Middle East quite a lot of people with Western experience and Western-oriented people who can project Western experiences onto problems of the East. This uh, apparent dichotomy, which seems to emerge from looking only at the Western picture, disappears when we begin to think about the people in the East who are working on this problem. If we take, for instance, the lemming effect, which has been spoken about, we should, I think, remember that overcrowding and overpopulation are endemic and have been in the East for centuries, perhaps millennia. The people in the East have tackled these problems in the past. Perhaps they have solved them, or some of them. Now, our colleague, Professor Akila Kiani of the University of Karachi, she is the head of the Department of Sociology, is carrying out a study into the traditional methods in the East of dealing with overpopulation and how this accumulated knowledge, this heritage which we in the East hold in trust for all mankind, 
may be applied to present and future problems and circumstances. Now, Mrs. Kiani is only one of these people. It has been said by some people that there would be, or could be, an uproar, shall we say, in the East if people from the West were to descend on them, shouting that the Earth is being polluted by the West, the ecological situation is desperate, and that because of what the people of the West have done in overproduction and despoiling the Earth, the people in the East must now give up a lot of their expectations. Now, of course, this is a completely bizarre picture. It has never been said, and it certainly will never be said. We in the Club of Rome have already working with us eminent and thoroughly qualified, very Eastern people who have already been contacted and, on, and are already working on these problems. It's not a question of the West telling the East what to do. It is a fact that already people from the West and the East are working together on these problems. As an instance, I might mention Professor Yusuf Shawabi, one of the world's great authorities on earth science of the University of Cairo, who is also a noted philosopher. He is cooperating with us on these problems as they affect the East. Then again we have Professor Abdus Salam of Pakistan, who is the head of the Institute of Physics in Trieste, one of the greatest physicists and scientists in the world. He is a member of the Club of Rome. His credentials in the West in science are impeccable, and his credentials as a major figure in a developing country are equally impeccable. Both these gentlemen and many others are fully committed to the concept that something must be done, but better, they are also committed to the fact that something is being done. They and others are now actively discussing and planning, both locally, nationally, and internationally, to try and determine, to isolate the problem, determine what the problems are, and to try to work out and suggest, and we only suggest, as you know, possible solutions. Now, many people know that we have several uh, distinguished Japanese as members of the Club of Rome. Japan, which has a terrible ecological problem, is one of the world's most deeply concerned countries about what can be done. Now, Japan is a developed country, but Japan is also an Eastern country. And this means that the Japanese can culturally, psychologically, and socially interact with people of the East, many of whom, alas, come from underdeveloped countries, and explain to them in an Eastern manner what the real problems are and how they might possibly be overcome. So we have these two important developments, one on either side of the world, the Argentines on the one hand with one foot in the developing world and the other in the developed world of the West, the Japanese with one foot in the developed world and one foot in the East which is largely developing. And in the middle we have what might be called the world of Islam. Now, estimates vary, but up to one man, woman, or child in five of the world's population belongs to this world of Islam, which is a patchwork of countries and communities which has a certain cultural unity. And it extends from Morocco in the west to China in the east. The importance of the world of Islam is that it too has one foot, if I might put it that way, in many different worlds. You may not perhaps realize, because people seem to think that uh, Islam is 
something like the Arabian Nights or the Arab world or something, that this cultural area straddles Africa, Asia, Europe, the Near East, the Middle East, Central Asia, and the Far East. Therefore, we regard those people who are working in the world of Islam as extremely important in this sense. If Professor Yalman of Istanbul, a Turk in a Western or Westernized country, cooperates as he does in this sense of urgency and understanding, since he in some way speaks a common language with the people of Indonesia, certainly a common cultural language, Professor Yalman can connect with the people of Indonesia who, on the other hand, are connecting with the Japanese. And he again, and other Western trained people, again like Professor Shawabi or Professor Kiani, can connect with the Western people, both developed and undeveloped, as the Americans being developed, say, where Professor Shawabi lived for a long time, or the Argentines, if you like, being developing, where, for instance, I lived for a long time in Argentina and speak the language. So you will see that this problem can be seen as focal points. Here and there, there are focal points. These points are of the greatest possible importance. The Club of Rome itself is a focal point and nothing more. It is a loose association of people from many countries, including Africa, Asia, and the Far East, and, of course, the developed countries. This loose association of people, in turn, has given rise to other focal points. These groupings and these individuals are already in being and are already working and are already increasing. So it's not a question of our having to bring this, as it were, to the uh, amazed and unwashed natives. It is a fact that throughout the world, in all communities, there are people who have scientific, technical, cultural, and other training and education, which makes it possible for them to receive and understand the message and the information which is being I almost said promoted, but certainly encouraged by the Club of Rome. So this international community of people who can listen to one another and are in constant communication and who in turn can speak to their own local people is in being and has in fact been in being for getting on for a hundred years in the sense that the impact of the West and of technology and the knowledge of the West about things in the East has been going on at a very considerable rate for a century. It is this community, linked as it is in modern times by such things as satellites, by such things as telex, by such things as mass communications of the so-called mass media, the newspapers, the radio and television, it is this community which is being very profoundly affected by the ecological problem and it is this community which contains what some people in the West call high achievers, no matter whether their country is developed or not, no matter whether they are achieving in science, in technology, in research, education, in culture, in literature, in international relations, these people are achievers. And these people, though small in numbers, are extremely powerful and effective in communication and in achievement. For this reason, any question as to whether the Club of Rome or the ecology movement has to sell itself to the westernized people of the East, for instance, or the eastern people of the East, any question of this sort is either entirely theoretical and based on a total ignorance of who or what does exist in the East or the underdeveloped countries, or else it could be posed by somebody or some people in the East and or in the developing countries who has not got 
the advantages or the privileges of interacting with these key individuals, these very numerous people, many of whom know one another and all of whom have means of access to one another, and very many of whom are, in fact, well informed about the Club of Rome or about the ecology problem, and all of whom will become increasingly informed about this in the future. So we really must not try to imagine a problem, a problem of communication or cooperation or understanding, which in fact does not exist. We should always remember that there will be some people in developing countries who oppose the ecology problem as put forward by experts. But after all, how can we ever forget that there is probably no place on earth where somebody does not oppose something? It's not a question that one should have no opposition. It is a question that one should spread knowledge and understanding. And that is what the Club of Rome is doing. And in so doing, the Club of Rome is enthusiastically and effectively supported by many people in developing countries of the East or the West who are in the real mainstream of life. There may be a few academics, a few specialists who are too much absorbed in local issues or who are perhaps well-serving specialized interests who are not aware of this enormous development. It would be a mistake to think that this really remarkable cooperation and communication facility does not exist. It would be anti-productive and, above all, it would be untrue. This was Idris Shah, the distinguished writer and authority on the Middle East. We have heard, both from Mr. Shah and from Dr. Aurelio Pache, a little bit about why a Club of Rome came into existence and what has been done as its first effort and its first report. Dr. King, might we ask you, are there likely to be consequences of this first report? Yes. I think, firstly, it's very important to realize that this first report was a report to the Club of Rome and not by the Club of Rome. So the Club and its various members have different points of view with regard to it. The executive of the Club of Rome, the, the kind of inner circle who do most of the work, uh, they have many criticisms of fact in relation to it, and many, many doubts in relation to some of the lessons that are being pulled from it. Nevertheless, we think its trend is right, namely that the interaction of these forces of population increase, of industrialization, of the demands for food, the demand for more agriculture, pollution, depletion of raw materials, that these are leading to a situation which is basically dangerous. Now, uh, the criticisms are of very varying kinds. First of all, there's a general criticism that this is futurology and something always happens to change things. Now, this is in fact not a real criticism, it is the intention of the report. This is not futurology. The, the report, The Limits to Growth, is an analysis of trends and their cross impacts, indicating what will happen unless we take steps change, with the intention that there should be deliberate discontinuities, deliberate changes, in order that this future which is predicted shall not happen. So it's, if you like, preventative futurology. And so that criticism is, in fact, really reinforcing what the Club of Rome wants to do. And what's the next thing this Club of Rome is doing? Uh, the next thing it's doing is uh, refining by other projects which are supporting the techniques, the assumptions, the analysis, and also encouraging people to disaggregate it to find out what the situation will be in individual places. Because the second criticism of the report is that this will never happen. It's too generalized all over the world, and one completely agrees with that. Now, uh, a further criticism, which raises new work possibilities also, uh, is that the 
limits to growth doesn't include in any case, in any way, value systems or basic moral aspects. This is deliberate because there's so many different value systems in the world, so many different cultural patterns, that in a first study of the total world resources, the, the, uh, the mean of these, the arithmetic mean of what is happening in a value system would have no value whatsoever. But when we get down to studying what is the situation with regard to Japan or Western Europe or Canada, then it will be possible to feed in these. And the Japanese have got a new project in which they're analyzing the main social trends of their country over the last decade and projecting these into the future and seeing how value systems will change their attitudes toward growth, industrialization, use of leisure, and many other things. In addition, <clears throat> many people, of course, particularly economists, say the thing is just, just downright wrong. The assumptions of the data are wrong. It's certainly not exact, but I think the order of magnitude is probably right. The time, the time scale may not be quite right. But after all, this is the first approach to entry a new field of research, namely the operation of the world. And to expect that the first research eruption into a new field will provide all the answers is extremely naive. This is just the beginning. It's a, it's a pioneering bit of work, and many others will follow. Two of them I'd like to mention particularly. Firstly, the underdeveloped countries have criticized this as being a kind of neo-colonialist approach of the advanced countries who have got her to a level of affluence which they like, but they've fouled their nest in the meantime. They want to clean up, and therefore they want to stop growing, which will mean less money for aid to the underdeveloped countries. And at the same time, they have the, uh, they, they have the affrontery to tell the, the underdeveloped countries to stop having more children. Well, we've met this through debates between the Club of Rome and, uh, for example, the Latin Americans. And after a bit, we came to the conclusion together that probably the trends of the limits of growth are right, but that it should be re-looked at from the point of view of the less developed countries. So a group has been got together at the Ar in the Argentine with people, intellectuals from some seven or eight Latin American countries, who are now looking at the world trends from the point of view of the less developed countries as a whole. Uh, they have, for example, worked out what should be a minimum welfare function in terms, of course, of money or of its equivalent in food and shelter, as well as basic education, etc., which every citizen of the world should have as a birthright. And can this be afforded by the resources of our globe at various levels of population? It's hoped that this will be reported to the United Nations sometime in a year to a year and a half's time. Another very interesting new project of the club is being undertaken in the Netherlands by Professor Linneman and under the general scientific advice of Professor Tinbergen, the Nobel Prize economist. Now, this assumes, as Tinbergen is convinced, that we cannot avoid the next doubling of the world population and that sometime between 28 and 40 years from now, there will be two people on the earth for everyone who is here today. Well, it has taken us hundreds of years, probably thousands, to build up the whole infrastructure of the world, the houses, the roads, the schools, the agricultural system, the cemeteries even, to provide for our existing population. Can we double this in 30 years? What are the prospects? What is going to be the effect on the economy? on trade, on agriculture, on the demand for materials? What is going to be the political consequence in aid and in the tensions between countries, in the striving for scarcer materials? What will be the, um, the, the demands in price of countries possessing, for example, oil or minerals in big demand? What will be, in fact, even the military consequences? We just don't know. And the Tinbergen study, being done very quietly by extremely responsible economists and sociologists and, so, and egg cultures and others, will try to give some answers to this much more limited question, which may give government some elements for policy decisions. 
This, of course, brings to my asking whether you are sanguine. That is, for instance, the findings of the Club of Rome and or others who may at some time be doing work of this kind on a global scale, that they will be able to get to the responsible members of government who will really listen sympathetically. I, th I think so. Whether the responsible members of government will be able to and capable of changing the situation is another question. But already members of the Club of Rome have had discussions with probably some 15 heads of state, prime ministers or cabinets, with very little action ensuing, but with a, a growing appreciation of the problems. And in a number of countries, Netherlands and Japan, for example, a local Club of Rome organizations have sprung up spontaneously, not under the main club at all, but in friendly or, or paternal relationships with them. And uh, these are striving hard, both in a non-political, political sense, uh, to get an appreciation both with political figures and with the general public of the situation. I think one will find that, on the one hand, the more statesmanlike people in politics will respond. They'll feel a responsibility. It may be naive to th think so, but I, I think it is happening. And secondly, the common people, and particularly the, the professional people and the scientists, the schoolmasters, the engineers, the economists, and thinking people everywhere, will more or more or less respond. The bureaucracies in between, the establishment, if you like, will be very, very much more resistant. So in a way, Dr. King, you pull the sting out of the criticism that one sometimes hears about the Club of Rome, that it is an elite society or made up very much of industrialists when you say that it is moving sideways into small groups of people. Oh. Yes. Well, the, the Club of Rome is a, it's an interesting phenomenon from one case, from one point of view. It is essentially a, no, a non-organization. It has no president, no secretary, no budget. And we, the last thing we want to do is to create our own bureaucracy because we think, we think we'll then just become an organization with offices and committee meetings and our influence will be brought into the, the normal pattern of committees and establishments. And that our only value is that we are completely free, we have no party political or ideological objectives, we're merely trying to do a job of education and of influencing people as to reality. We have no political objectives. And this can only be done as long as we have this small size and complete mobility. We don't want to dictate anything. We don't want to put up blueprints even. That's for others. So it's elite because a small group of people is elite, self-chosen. It's not really elite in an industrial sense. There are not very many industrialists in it. it there perhaps are a fifth of the members are industrialists. It's a mixture of industrialists, scientists, a sprinkling of bankers, humanists, social scientists but not dominated by industrial thinking in any way whatsoever. The fact that Mr. Pichet, who's taken such a, a big role in this, is an industrialist, in some sense is irrelevant. He merely happens to be an exceptional man who through concern and conviction has done this. He might have been a professor. The three speakers on this cassette were Dr. Alexander King, Dr. Aurelio Pichet, and Idris Shah. They were talking to Robert O. Miller. This is the first of a five-part series. The other titles are Population, A Delicate Balance, catalogue number SS109, Waters of the World, Examining Pollution in Seas, River and Lakes, number SS110, Why Save Wild Animals, with Guy Nonford and Gerald Durrell, number SS-111, and Technology, the Two-Edged Sword, number SS-112. All these cassettes can be obtained from your usual supplier, but if you have difficulty getting them or would like to receive details of other titles in Seminar Cassettes list, please contact us direct. Seminar Cassettes, 218, Sussex Gardens, London, W2. Telephone 
0126273357.